Good morning. I have to get settled again. My little dog Skylar decided to make a joyful noise this morning. So, uh, anyway, welcome and good morning uh, to morning prayer coming to you live from my home. I'm Melinda St. Clair, director of St. Luke's Episcopal Church in downtown Billings, Montana. So, um, if you have your prayer book or uh, PDF or regular, whatever you have. I hope that you will join in fully. Um, and uh, we'll be using the proper readings today for the tw on this. If you have your flyer, it's the 12th Sunday after the Pentecost. Um, and so you can have that ready. But our service this morning begins on page, oops, begins on page 78 in your Book of Common Prayer. So please turn to page 78. I hope that you will say all the responses uh, with me if you have a prayer book. And uh, certainly if you want to say the part I'm saying too at some point, that's okay. Uh, but uh, I just will imagine you saying the responses with me. So let us begin. On page 78. Thus says the High and Lofty One, who inhabits eternity, whose name is Holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with the One who has a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. We will continue with the Invitatory and Psalter on page 80. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. Come, let us adore God. On page number 82, please join with me in saying the Vanity, which comes from Psalm 95, page 82. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a king above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. 
Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Our psalm this morning is Psalm number 124. It's in your leaflet. You may also find it, you can find it on page 781 in your prayer book. Please join me in saying Psalm 124. If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel now say, if the Lord had not been on our side when enemies rose up against us, then would they have swallowed us up alive in their fierce anger towards us. Then would the waters have overwhelmed us and the torrent gone over us. Then would the raging waters have gone right over us. Blessed be the Lord. He has not given us over to be prey for their teeth. But we have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowler. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Okay, our first reading today is from the book of Exodus, chapter 1, beginning with verse 8. A reading from Exodus. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us, and escape from the land. Therefore they set, task, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramesses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multitude and multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they had imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. But she put, she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came to bathe at the river, while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then the sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. 
So the woman took the child and nursed it. And when the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she, she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Turning to page 85 in your prayer book, for obvious reasons, we're going to say together the Song of Moses. Canticle number eight on page 85. I will sing to the Lord for he is lofty and uplifted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my refuge. The Lord has become my savior. This is my God, and I will praise him, the God of my people, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a mighty warrior. Yahweh is his name. The chariots of Pharaoh and his army he has hurled into the sea. The finest of those who bear armor have been drowned in the sea. The fathomless deep has overwhelmed them. They sank into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in might. Your right hand, O Lord, has overthrown the enemy. Who can be compared with you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, awesome in renown, and worker of wonders? You stretched forth your right hand. The earth swallowed them up. With your constant love, you led the people you redeemed. With your might, you brought them in safety to your holy dwelling. You bring them in and plant them on the mount of your possession. The resting place you have made for yourself, O Lord, the sanctuary, O Lord, that your hand has established. The Lord shall reign forever and forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Our second reading this, this morning is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. A reading from Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but to think of yourselves with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For in as in one body we have many members, and not all members have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On page number 95 in your prayer book, we will say together the Te Deum Laudamus, the You Are God. And it's a page turner. So on page 95, canticle number 21. You are God, we praise you. You are the Lord, we acclaim you. You are the eternal Father. All creation worships you. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, cherubim and seraphim, sing in endless praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of prophets praise you. 
the white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you, Father of majesty unbounded, you are true and only, your true and only Son, worthy of all worship, and the Holy Spirit, advocate and guide. You, Christ, are the King of glory, the eternal Son of the Father. When you became man, you set us free. You did not shun the virgin's womb. You overcame the sting of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You are seated at God's right hand in glory. We believe that you will come and be our judge. Come then, Lord, and help your people, bought with the price of your own blood, and bring us with your saints to everlasting glory. Our third reading this morning is from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 16, beginning with verse 13. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples, not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you saw the invitation this morning on Facebook, uh, for this morning and the one for evening prayer last night, uh, you saw a couple of photographs that I took when I was in Israel, in, uh, or the Holy Land, more than Israel, uh, in um, the year 2000. And it's of the headwaters of the Jordan River. Uh, they come bubbling just out of the rock right there, and that's where it all begins. And uh, so there's a photo of that. But the other is, is, at that same place, there's a carving in the wall, which is uh, the Temple of Pan. And archaeologists have told us, historians have taught us, that this area this headwaters of the Jordan, was an area of great holiness and re renown for a lot of different religions. And we see one evidence of that in the Temple of Pan being there. Uh, one of the, the gods of the, the uh, in Greek and Roman cultures, I guess, you never heard of a pan flute, but uh, he was a god that people came to this place to worship him. And um, I think because it's a place where a lot of rich religions come to look for answers, perhaps. I think that's why Jesus chose this place to ask these disciples this probing question. Who do you say that I am? But he starts with, who do the people say that I am? Now, you know, he knows what other people are saying about him. You know, who do you think he is? Well, you know, he's just a carpenter or he's a great prophet or you know, he's a healer, a miracle worker. And they say other things too. And the disciples say, well, some say that you're John the Baptist. Well, let's think about that for a minute. I mean, there are times we can say maybe with, with Elijah or Jeremiah, we could say, well, that's an indication they believed in reincarnation. Maybe some did. When he says maybe the people say, well, that's John the Baptist. I mean, you would think about it. John the Baptist was killed during Jesus' lifetime. Jesus was a grown man by then. So did, did the spirit of John the Baptist come back and possess or inhabit Jesus, this man on earth? Well, I don't know what all those people were thinking. 
but Jesus wanted to kind of get some of that out of the way. Maybe he found it amusing or interesting. Maybe he really didn't know and he wanted to know, but I think he probably knew. But anyway, but he asked the disciples, yeah, but what about you? You worship the one God. You come out of the Jewish tradition. So you know that all these other gods don't mean anything. But who do you say that I am? And Peter gives that most profound and all-telling answer. You're the Messiah, the Son of the living God the son of the living God. And Jesus says something like, you're right. That is exactly right, Peter. Oh my gosh, you finally get it. And you said it out loud. But you know, that's because you let God speak through you, he's telling Peter. Because your mind, your reason, all the stuff you hear in the world didn't tell you who I really am. God revealed that to you. And you were able to receive that information from God and then you were able to say it out loud you are the Messiah the son of the living God and he says you are blessed and because of that he says he gives him a new name he calls him Rocky he says you're Peter Simon we're gonna I'm gonna call you Peter from now on which means rock it comes from the Greek Petrus Petra, actually, which is the feminine derivation of uh, rock, by the way, Petra. He says, I'm going to make you into a rock. And from there, the church will be born. Now, and I'm going to build it. Now, we've got to remember that the writer of this gospel said this, that Jesus said, I will build my church. But there's no really ever, ever evidence or indication any other places that Jesus intended to build a church as we know it today. The word in Greek is the ecclesia. That means the gathering. Ecclesia means the gathering, and we get the word church from that. Jesus is saying, Look, you're going to be the solid foundation upon which or around which my gathered people, the gathering of my people, are going to stand. Are going to come. People are going to gather around you because you're a solid foundation. You're a rock. And people, people will gather. My people will gather. And from that, from you, then from that solid foundation, you, the church, Peter, you can then say the truth about God, about Jesus, about what's real and true and holy. Now, scholars have wrestled with it. I myself have wrestled with uh, over the years. Well, Peter, who's Peter now? Is there a Peter now? Was this when Jesus says, look, Peter, you're the rock. You're the solid foundation. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And the gates of Hades won't prevail against it. Did he mean just that one time, that human man, Peter, that his apostle, followed him that was standing right in front of him to you I'm giving the keys to the kingdom whatever you bind and loose is gonna go Protestant theologians have said yes that Peter was a one-time person these keys were given to that man at that time then now Roman Catholic theology and tradition would say that Peter is the Pope that in the apostolic succession from Peter to the next to the next to the next to the next popes the Bishop of Rome the Pope they are descended directly from Peter and therefore are the current day embodiment of Peter and so a lot, of, a lot of power and authority is given to the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church to say, this is dogma doctrine. You know, this is okay, this isn't okay. He's the one that has the keys, and he's the one that says, whatever I bind, you know, in heaven will be bound, or whatever I loose on, I'm on loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So as that applied in Protestant way of thinking, uh, uh, that was the one time Peter that could bind and loose. 
in the Roman Catholic way of thinking, that ongoing authority is given to the Pope in Rome. But we're Anglicans. We're the middle way. And so I asked my spiritual director long, many, many you know, decades ago, uh, well, you know, who's Peter? Who gets to bind and loose? Who's got the case of the kingdom now? All that kind of stuff. And he thoughtfully gave me an answer I think is probably pretty true, I think is, um, that for us, for we Anglicans, the bishops, the, the collective house of bishops would be considered Peter for us today. The collective wisdom of the church in the councils of the church, which include other clergy and lay people, but in the councils of the church, with the house of bishop being Peter, uh, you know, contemporarily. What we bind and loose on earth is bound and loose on heaven. So however you want to conceive of that right now, think about the awesome responsibility that we here on earth have regarding heaven. We like to separate. We think, well, we're here on earth now and we get to go to heaven someday. But Jesus continually teaches us that, you know, the kingdom of heaven has come near. The kingdom of heaven is here now. You're, you're, you're responsible for ushering it in now. And so when he says, you know, whatever you bind is bound in heaven, meaning if we, the collective Peter, says, you know, that's not okay. We're not going to accept that. That's bad theology. We're going to reject that, uh, that, that, th that way of thinking, that behavior, whatever it is, no, here on earth, then it's also bound in heaven. Okay. So for instance, if the collective Peter here on earth decides that we're not going to, uh, let people just, uh, starve to death under our noses that attitude that behavior that caring for one another then if not i mean not caring we're just letting them starve you know are we gonna let people have that attitude in heaven no because it's bound right it's not okay we're not going to accept it on earth it's not gonna be accepted in heaven and likewise though when we say as a collective uh peter Whatever is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. So if we loose good things, if we loose uh, love God and love your neighbor, if we loose compassion and mercy and holiness and, and care and openness, that's going to be loosed in heaven as well. We have a responsibility for the things that we choose to do, follow, think, believe here in this life because heaven and earth are not two separate entities, separate realities. Okay? Heaven and earth are intimately bound together for all time in eternity. And so we have to be cognizant that what goes on here has an effect on what goes on in heaven. That's kind of hard to think about because we think, well, paradise is heaven. I mean, here, heaven is paradise. Well, then maybe we need to be working to make earth be a little more heaven-like. Where there are no castes, there are no uh, important people and unimportant people. There are no, these matter, those don't matter. There's no social climbing. There's no political agendas. There's no uh, career ladders. There's no worry. We just be the people God allows us and wants us and shapes us to be. Who do you say that I am? You know, you're going to... Maybe, I hope you are, but at least imagine yourself being asked that question. 
You know, maybe your next door neighbor or your child or grandchild or your parent or someone at the store or a coworker or someone in school or someone you met briefly. You know, they say, well, you know, who do you say Jesus is? What do you have to say about Jesus? And like Peter, we can answer, well, Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the one who comes to save us from ourselves, the anointed one, God's uh, full revelation on earth, the son of the living God, living God. When Jesus tells Peter, I give you the keys to the kingdom, and against it, the gates of Hades won't prevail against it. Two big points there. One is, we have this image in our mind of Jesus, or I mean Peter standing at the pearly gates, deciding who gets to come in and who gets to go out. And I love a good pearly gates uh, meme and joke, just like the next one. Like he's standing there with a cat saying, are you coming in or not? In or out? Make up your mind kind of thing. But that's, that's not the kind of keys that Jesus gives Peter. He's not the gatekeeper. Okay. The key is, what are the keys to heaven? Doing God's will. Loving God. Loving your neighbor as yourself. Having compassion and mercy and justice. And in being able to embrace the change that God brings in us. We start changing and growing from the moment of our conception. And we continue to do that physically. We know that throughout life. I think we're supposed to do that spiritually too. And while we are children of God and made new, brand new baby Christians in our baptism, we're not meant to stay there. We're meant to grow into the full likeness of Christ who, in whom we live and move and have our being. And so Peter knows the key to manifesting heaven on earth. That's what Jesus is giving him in, in Peter's humility and openness to being a vessel of God's action. Then Peter has the key to manifesting heaven, the kingdom of heaven. And also, um, when Jesus says the gates of Hades won't prevail against it, we have to remember what Hades, the word Hades means. It's not hell. Hades is not the the hell, the place of torment that Dante's Inferno, Inferno presents to us. It isn't like the demons and the tormentors and all the horrible stuff get to come up and, you know, possess us and do horrible things. The Hades is the place, the realm of the dead, and that's all. It's where people go when they die. And in Jewish thinking, Pharisaic Jewish thinking anyway, the idea was that when you die, when your body dies, you go there and you wait. You wait in Hades until the resurrection of the dead, which happens on the last day all at once and so forth, and the Messiah comes. Um, the realm of the dead is just the place where the dead reside. But he says, God, the gates of Hades won't prevail against it. In other words, the church, the ecclesia, the gathering of Christ's people around the solid foundation of Peter, the teachings of the apostles, is the, that is, has the God of the living. And so the dead aren't going to get to prevail against the living, the 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 God of the living, because we are alive. We are alive in Christ. And death has no dominion over us, not only the death of our body, but the death of our minds and our souls. We are part of that ecclesia. We are the ecclesia around which the solid foundation of Peter is there for us to gather around. And so know that, know those things, reflect on those things so that when you are asked, I hope you put yourself in positions to be asked, when you are asked, what do you have to say about Jesus? 
who do you say that I am? You're going to have an answer. And it will be an answer that is given you around the solid foundation amongst the gathering of God's people, which frankly is everybody. So go forth and figure out and say out loud, who do you say Jesus is? Amen. Let us continue on page 96 in your prayer book. Please say with me the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Just a moment. I'm using technology for the prayers today and my page went away. Um, just a moment. Contemplate who you say Jesus is for just a moment with me. And now continuing on page 97. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Please say with me, pray with me the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. On page 98, we will say this morning, suffrage is B. I will say the verse, and you please say the response. But I'll say the response with you. So if you want to say the verse with me, that's okay too. Suffrages B. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep, this na keep us from all sin today. Have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy for we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope, and we shall never hope in vain. The Collect of the Day, I'm taking from here. It's for the uh, proper uh, prayer for the 12th Sunday after Pentecost. And then I will continue on with some various other collects and prayers. Let us pray. Grant, O merciful God, that your church, being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit, may show forth your power among all peoples to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. O God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessing through our worship of you, that the week to come may be spent in your favor. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life, and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defense, may not fear the power of any ad adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose Spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers, which we offer before you for all members of your holy Church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The prayers of the people today are Form 4, which is found on page 388 in your prayer book. But you won't need to follow along in your prayer book if you can't or don't want to. Uh, after each petition, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and you will respond with, hear our prayer. So let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and, all, and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all those whose lives are closely linked with ours, especially those who have become unemployed in this pandemic, and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as Christ loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Protect, strengthen, and comfort all those fighting, fleeing, and facing the fires in California. Help the wildlife and domestic animals being so devastated as well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. We pray especially for those on our parish prayer list, including David, Bridget, Eddie, Paul, Michelle, Ryan, Parker, Steve, Zeke, Sienna, Jake, Lillian, Nancy, Alyssa, Lisa, Bob, Carolyn, Ken, Janie, Dawn, Carmen, RJ, Bernie, Gabby, Rose, Neil, Shiloh, and any others you care to lift to God now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, especially Gail Tasinski and Joanne McCormick, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we give thanks and pray for the Church of the Promise Province of Southeast Asia, the Most Reverend Melter Thais, Archbishop of Southeast Asia, and Bishop of Sabah. In the Diocesan cycle of prayer, we give thanks and pray for St. Patrick's in Big Fork, Louise Baker, Rector. In the Parish cycle of prayer, 
We give thanks and pray for Stephanie Vincent, Gary Waddingham, Marnie Walter and Megan Lowe, and Tom and Kim Weber. Amen. And I continue with additional uh, prayers found in the back of the prayer book, beginning with a prayer for peace. Eternal God, whose perfect kingdom no sword is drawn but the sword of righteousness, no strength known but the strength of love, so mightily spread abroad your spirit that all peoples may be gathered under the banner of the Prince of Peace, as children of one Father, to whom be dominion and glory now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, whom we must account for all our powers and privileges, guide the people of the United States in the election of officials and representatives, that by faithful administration and wise laws, the rights, may, uh, the rights of all may be protected and our nation be enabled to fulfill your purposes. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, in the course of this busy life, give us times of refreshment and peace, and grant that we may also that we may so use our leisure to rebuild our bodies and renew our minds, that our spirits may be open to the goodness of your creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, whose fatherly care reaches to the uttermost parts of the earth, we humbly beseech you graciously to behold and bless those whom we love, now absent from us. Defend them from all dangers of soul and body, and grant that both they and we, drawing nearer to you, may be bound together by your love in the community of your Holy Spirit, communion of your Holy Spirit in the fellowship of your saints, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, finally, uh, please, return, uh, please turn to page 125. 125. Please say with me the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all the goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, in your immeasurable love, in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Please join me in saying a prayer of St. Chrysostom. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. I bless you in the name of the Holy Trinity, the sacred three in one. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the hollow of God's hand. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Glory to God whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Let us go forth to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. That concludes our service of morning prayer. I will finish by just saying uh, that it was good to see uh, so many of you on our Zoom fellowship last Sunday at 1 o'clock. We're going to do that again, and I can't tell you the date because the date's on my phone, and that's what I'm using right now to talk to you. But it's the Sunday after uh, Labor Day in September, and uh, at noon, not one, at noon, noon o'clock, uh, we'll have another Zoom fellowship. And so uh, you will receive an email invitation uh, in, the, in your email when that's closer and get other communication as time draws near. But please mark your calendar to join us at noon on the Sunday after Labor Day uh, for a Zoom fellowship. Uh, I think it was, it was good and fun for the people to see each other and talk. Um, Things are just kind of going on as they do, and uh, I'll, I'll remind you next Sunday at 9, we have our good Coffee Talk Bible study, and you're all welcome to join us. If you'd like to join us and haven't, ha re don't, haven't received a Zoom invitation for the 9 a.m. Uh, Bible study, uh, I'll be happy to send you one. And you know what? You don't even have to be here in Billings or a member of this church. I'm saying to a couple people who I know are watching, if you can and would like to join us for the Bible study, your voices would be more than welcome. So I'm going to say farewell for now. I hope that you have a really good day and stay cool and also stay cool and uh, go forth.